Before we get started, I've got a request to make of all of you. And that is, do not take pictures and do not post on social media that you are attending this talk, at least not until it's over. Um, there's a good reason for this, and that's because last time I spoke at a conference about harassment, the conference itself started getting harassed immediately because people are searching my name on social media and harassing anybody who talks about me, as several people here found out last night. So, most of you probably know who I am. Um, I used to be a FreeBSD committer, and I've been in tech for a long time, mostly doing some incarnation of what people now call DevOps. So, I've spoken here before about various technical things. But today I'm going to talk about social issues. I worked on Sysinstall before. That was so much easier than this. Talking about people <laughs> and social problems is really hard. Um, I debated for a while on how I was going to give this talk because I'm kind of tired of talking about myself, but there's a, there's a power in telling people something has happened to somebody they know. So today I'm going to tell you my story and what's happened to me in the past eight months and why we should care about this issue. So I'm going to break the cardinal rule of public speaking. When I submitted to the CFP, I thought I could handle this without a problem. But in the past eight months, I've been through a lot and I'm pretty tough. But the more time I spent here at BSD Can around my friends, practically my family, the more I realized that standing up in front of all of you and talking about all of this was going to be really hard. Um, so I wrote my talk down and I'm going to read it. Sorry. <sighs> Too many feelings make coherency really, really difficult. It's not really accurate to say that all of this started with Gamergate, but that's where I'm going to begin. At this point, most of you have probably heard of Gamergate. For those that haven't, I'm going to give you the short version. It's a harassment campaign that is specifically targeting women developers. While it was initially only going after women in the gaming industry, eventually they started going after any women that caught their attention. Ground Zero was my friend, Zoe Quinn. They hacked all of her accounts, harassed her family, went after her career, and threatened her until she had to leave her home. She was couch hopping for six months, too afraid to stay in any one place for too long. She tried to talk about the things that were happening to her and the threats that she was receiving, but she was accused of making everything up. I saw the threats, and they weren't any surprise to me. I've been quietly dealing with some ma pretty major forms of harassment for nearly 20 years. I wasn't able to act on the things that were happening to me, but after seeing her go through, even worse, I couldn't stay silent. So I sent out a string of tweets that amounted to how we shouldn't disbelieve women when they say they're getting harassed. I didn't expect this to be a hugely controversial statement, but I was immediately proven wrong. Over the next 12 hours, I received thousands of tweets, many of which were graphically abusive. I ended up sitting in the bed in the dark at 3 in the morning, still staring at Twitter on my phone as I tried to figure out how to process what was happening to me. Adam Baldwin, the Adam Baldwin from the TV series Firefly and Chuck, was stirring up more people to come after me. I tried to explain to him that all I had said was that women get harassed and we need to believe this. And in return, he asked me if I was a cultural Marxist and sent me a picture of a graphically tortured animal. This was surreal to say the least. I was scared and panicking. I had a moment where I considered leaving the internet for a while. I didn't know what to do. I mean, being harassed by a celebrity and a mob was a pretty new experience for me. The anxiety almost won, but something else happened. <sighs> he might be Adam Baldwin, but I'm free BSD girl, God damn it and I'm not going to be chased off the internet by some dude that uses phrases like cultural Marxism. I'm better than that. So I got angry instead. <laughs> and I've been angry ever since. I, considered, I continued speaking out against harassment. Every morning, I would wake up, get my coffee, sit at my computer, and read through hundreds of hateful messages. Just a second. I would block each person. The problem was blocking one person didn't accomplish anything. It was a huge mob and they were pissed. Anytime I tried to have any kind of conversation, they would butt in, a process that quickly became known as sea lioning, thanks to this wonderful wonder mark comment. Meanwhile, I watched Kathy Sierra get run off the internet by one of the same people that had been harassing me since I was a teenager. 
Rob Graham told her that she deserved it, so I told him he was full of shit. And in return, Kevin Mitnick started threatening my career. I decided to go public with my own story of harassment. <laughs> and it made one of the top 10 Hacker News posts that day, much to my surprise. The support started pouring in, but so did the threats. I was about to go to BlizzCon, my favorite convention. I've been looking forward to this all year. I knew that I wouldn't be able to go there and tweet about it and share things with my friends without having to filter through all the abuse. And I was getting so tired of feeling like I was digging my way out of shit mountain. I got home from work one night and I started drinking. After about half a bottle of tequila, I decided I was literally going to replace all of these jerks with a Pearl script. In about 20 minutes, I had written a 200 line Pearl script that did exactly that. <laughs> The script used the Twitter API to pull down the follower list. Oops. Uh, I lost my place. <laughs> to pull down the follower list for a few of the key people in Gamergate that were instigating harassment. If someone was following more than one of them, it blocked them. This was very simple, but surprisingly effective, with an exceptionally low number of false positives. I tweeted about it, and everyone was interested, so I decided to make it open source and post the code on GitHub. If I had been able to see into the future, I probably would have chosen a language that was not Perl. <laughs> I did not expect the drunken Perl script to be the thing that people remember me by, but as far as legacies go, I guess I've seen worse. <laughs> It was a massive success. Thousands of people signed up to use the block list I created. Then life got really weird. I found myself besieged by the press. My code was covered in Newsweek, New Scientist, Business Insider, New York Times, and many others. The positive feedback was overwhelming. On the other hand, I found myself the subject of quite a few hit pieces, the major ones being by a reporter from Breitbart that was trying to make a name for himself. He's been on my case ever since. Some lawyer even hired a private investigator to dig up dirt on me. I went public with everything a few months ago in that blog post, so he wasted a bunch of money on nothing. I started getting threats of lawsuits. People were really angry about being blocked on Twitter. <laughs> Those being blocked so that I was a threat to free speech. I received death and rape threats on a regular basis. My boss received a flood of emails telling him what a terrible person I was. So did my parents, so did the FreeBSD mailing lists, because apparently I am employed by FreeBSD and they wanted to get me fired. Yeah. <laughs> well, your, your performance reviews. <laughs> <laughs> so my code was picked apart, and I was told repeatedly that I was a horrible coder. This is not an uncommon experience to any woman successful in open source. It was just at a much higher volume. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> we have Alfred Pearl stuff. <laughs> So this happens all the time, and I've got hundreds more of these things saved and screenshotted. It was suggested by many people that I had only managed to get a commit bit by sleeping with every FreeBSD committer. This is typical. These are the things that are usually said behind closed doors for many, many female developers. This time, I just got it said to my face. Eventually, one angry person showed up outside my office. He took a selfie there and posted it to Twitter. I looked through his tweets, and he had been posting maps to my office for quite a while. People were riling him up, and he said he was going to come back the next time with a knife. Internet threats had crossed over to real life in a very dangerous and scary way. So I appealed to the EFF for help via email, which I then screen capped and posted to Twitter. Being threatened into silence was attack on free speech, so it seemed like something that might catch their interest. It went viral retweeted by the likes of Will Wheaton, Chris Clue, John Scalzi, Phil Plate, and many others. Everyone was watching. 
and the EFF responded. I was directed to a lawyer formally from the EFF. Incidentally, she was the lawyer that had defended the person who had been harassing me for 20 years. We went to the police, and I found out just how much the legal system failed when it came to dealing with online harassment. We were given the runaround, and nothing happened. I was still working full time at a gaming company, and my time was limited, so I had to let it go. I hoped that he was scared enough that he wouldn't come back. He was just some dumb kid, but I was more worried about other people being encouraged by his behavior, trying to one-up him. During all of this, I'd been writing more code, gathering data. I had generated a huge Redis database where I was watching how various groups worked. At this point, people were coming to me with their problems. I was watching Gamergate, trolls of the Black Lives Matter hashtag, TERFs, which is trans exclusionary radical feminists. And I even got a request from someone to start watching ISIS. I would study each group and find the patterns to determine how they worked. I could look at the metadata for any given account on Twitter and generate a score for each of these groups, telling you how likely it was for them to be a member. It was pretty rad. No one else was doing anything like this, and I found it fascinating. I continued talking to the EFF, Twitter, and other companies. Weirdly, they were all listening to me. The EFF told me I was the leading expert in online harassment. I had always wanted to be an expert in something. I never really expected it to be internet assholes. <laughs> Fortunately, in mid-January, I was laid off. <laughs> At this point, I hadn't really been sleeping because I was trying to work on harassment issues while holding down a full-time job. I was told later at a party by my boss, who was nearly in tears, that he had fought for me, but the order had come down from upper management that I needed to be included in the layoffs. It was a gaming company, and they were tired of being harassed by Gamergate. So Gamergate succeeded. They got me let go from my job. They clearly didn't think this one through. On the BART ride home, I decided to work on this full time. It's the first thing I had ever really felt this passionate about. I could do something that was interesting, that no one else was doing, and it would help people. I announced that I would be doing this full time, and I set up a Patreon account so people could donate money to help fund my work. The people targeting me saw that me supposedly cashing in on harassment. Although, really, who leaves a lucrative DevOps career to exist off donations? So I became even more of a target. I expanded my efforts to start monitoring the dark corners of the internet where no one wants to go, 8chan. Here, I saw them making plans ranging from sending pizza like a low-rent Bart Simpson to mailing me explosives. Then I saw them planning to swap me. If you aren't familiar with what this means, it's a phenomenon that has become more popular in recent years. It's attempted murder by cop. Someone will phone the police, say they're at an address and about to kill somebody, and a SWAT team will bust down the door. This has led to people being killed. It's very common for dogs to be shot. When I saw these threats, I knew it was very likely they would act on them, so I went back to the police. I wrote about my experiences with this on my blog, and I want to leave a decent amount of time at the end for Q&A, so you're welcome to read about it there. The short version of the story is, yes, I was swatted. There were police with guns, and they showed up at my apartment when I wasn't expecting it. It was scary, but it could have gone worse. I was prepared, and I turned it into a learning experience so that other people could use my tactics to protect themselves. I turned this terrible thing into a win, like I did with every single thing they did to me. They started going after anyone who was friends with me on Facebook, just because they realized they couldn't phase me, because I was fucking nuts. I had to warn people to unfriend me if they were worried. The physical threats started ramping up. I had to start keeping a bag ready near the door in case I thought someone was on their way over. I spent quite a few days away from my apartment, but I wasn't going to quit what I was doing. The more experience I gained in this field, the more I realized that an organization needed to exist to address the technical issues of online harassment. I had made a huge amount of impact with a tiny amount of code. I knew that I could do more. By March, I had been contacted by many companies in the Bay Area, all of whom wanted help because they didn't know what to do. Everyone is fighting the same problem and they are lost. I was able to go in, sign NDAs, learn about their infrastructure, and make suggestions that would help curb abuse while having a low engineering impact. I started meeting with Twitter, and even they were implementing some of my suggestions. 
a few companies had already contacted me asking me to come help them design commercial solutions, but I don't think protection from abuse should come at a price, especially since online harassment is disproportionately aimed at dis disenfranchised groups. I decided to make the jump and start a nonprofit, the Online Abuse Prevention Initiative. OAPI, despite still being in the middle of finding all the paperwork, is working with a lot of tech companies on their issues already. We've been working with Twitter extensively, so much so that we were able to release a new tool, Shields Up, that used, that used a feature the day they announced it. We're working with law enforcement because it came apparent that police have no idea what they are doing when it comes to online harassment. Two weeks ago, I had been threatened by someone who had been fixating on me for six months. He flew into town from Texas. We knew exactly where he was, and he was saying that he was gonna do a drive-by on my apartment. I went to the police, again, and they knew nothing about California Penal Code 646.9, which applied towards the situation. They told me to call when he showed up at the apartment. I was displeased. So now we're creating training materials for the police. It's gonna take a while because laws are different in each state, but we're gaining traction with the federal government as well as a few attorney general's offices. We're also working with companies to push for better developer policies so we can write the code to do what these companies don't want to do themselves. This is going surprisingly well, and I wish I could talk about more of those things, but sadly, I am buried under a pile of NDAs. All the code we're writing is open source, and you can check out our GitHub if you wanna see what kind of projects we're working on. I want the community to be involved in this. I want you all to be invested because this is a problem that in some way will touch every single one of us. I'm great at thinking up interesting ways to fight back, but there are a lot of people that are better devs than me and I need their help because I can't do this all by myself. In particular, I do wanna mention one of our projects that's still very much in planning, and that's Project Carlton. Carlton allows users to track abuse they've received from any conceivable platform creating individual and private case files that can be easily viewed and downloaded by that user, presumably for taking to the police. These case files would include all the identifying and content information required for law enforcement to make a data preservation request to the provider. Additionally, the data we'd be gathering would allow us to more easily track harassment patterns over different forms of social media. We've been talking to almost all of the major social media companies and we're getting a lot of support from them with almost unheard of levels of access. This is the perfect time to get involved in something really awesome that is already changing the world in noticeable ways. We're making history all because of some dumpy Perl script that I wrote while drunk and angry. A lot of people want to help, but I'm gonna warn you against doing what I do. I live a very public life. There is nothing left that is private or sacred. I am constantly under attack. It's extremely isolating because I know if I let anyone get close to me, they will become a target. I'm constantly having to watch everyone around me when I go outside to make sure that no one stares a little too hard. When people recognize me, I have to wonder if they're friend or foe. At most conferences, I now require a security escort. Find me later, bring me a drink, and ask me about that because I've got some stories. There are still ways that you can help. We are more than happy to accept pull requests. I know that there's a lot of engineers in this room that make a lot of money. I know because I used to make that kind of money too. Now I'm completely funding OAPI through donations made to my personal Patreon and PayPal. The 501c3 isn't up yet and I'll be announcing what it is hopefully in the next few months. I'm happy to take donations though. These wouldn't be tax deductible quite yet. Before we get to the Q&A, I want to close this by reading a few tweets I wrote last night. One of the best and worst things about BSD can is that I'm now able to remember what my life used to be like before every day became a battle. Being around this much love makes it so much harder to talk about the terrible things that have happened. It's even worse when people tell me I couldn't do the things that you do. I don't want your sympathy. I want your rage that this is happening to so many people, that it could happen to you or to someone that you love. Don't feel sorry for me. Feel angry for me. Fight for me. Because in the end, I'll tell you my story, but it's not about me. It's about everyone. This fights for you. Um, <coughs> give me a moment. <laughs>
and I will answer questions. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> Coffee is very restorative. Yeah. Uh, what is what's the typical reaction that folks are getting from uh, local police departments? Not that, besides indifference, when they say <laughs> what's the not from a comedy perspective, uh, but what are what what are the police asking for as far as help understanding? They're saying, what do you want us to do about it? That's basically what it comes down to. Unless you have a lawyer with you, they don't pay attention to you. They're like, it's the internet, why don't you just close your browser? They don't realize that this stuff does affect you offline. And I've been saying for a while that we shouldn't say things on the internet that we wouldn't say in person in front of a police officer. And that's something we really need to start pushing because we actually have really good laws. We have amazing laws. We don't need more laws. We need police to understand the laws that we have. So are, do they consider the internet not to be real? Yeah. Okay. So it, it's, more of, it's more of a perception that the internet is some kind of generic role play. So my friend Zoe is a game developer, and she tried to get a restraining order against her ex who started Gamergate. And the judge told her, after, as he was denying the restraining order, just get a new career. Get off the internet. <laughs> that's just typically what happens people people say it's just words you know it's just words and the fact is people are assholes I'm an asshole you're an asshole everybody's an asshole sometimes the problem is when you have 5,000 assholes coming at you and when you have that mob and when you have threats when you have threats you never know if they're going to be real or not and you don't want to take the chance that they could be, that these, this person's actually going to act. You don't want to be the example. Do you have any experience of states or countries that actually do handle this well? Right now, we're focusing in the US. Um, I know that as far as the swatting attacks go, they usually come from Germany. Um, I don't know much about international law yet. That's way down the road for us, but it is something we're going to be targeting. So you said, you said come from Germany? So yeah. the threats are being... Through Skype. Squatting occurs in the States, but the, the threats originate in Germany. Yeah. Okay. Can you book Canada? Uh, they don't take you seriously. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll, I'll add to Randy that this is not just a U.S. problem. Um, some of you will know that I live in the Middle East where we don't have laws against sexual harassment. We have nothing, so you can't rely on uh, the legal environment. And in the Middle East, there will be prominent attacks against any woman around the world. And I mean around the world. This is not a US problem. The attackers will come from Germany, they will come from Saudi Arabia. They will come from educated countries like Morocco. The issue is education, but we cannot, it's not possible, and this is why I'm going to ask you a question, so I'm just leading to the question. Uh, education will take 25, 50 years to understand that sexual harassment is not acceptable, especially as it's embedded in their culture. A woman does not have a right to speak. A, a woman can be raped, and the law does not exist against rape. So my question to you is, how can we make this, and, and I appreciate you have a lot of experience, how can we make this a global issue? I know I'm going very far, but what's your take on this? Right now I'm taking it one day at a time. And the U.S. is obviously my market, so that's where, we're, where I'm starting. But a lot of people are coming into this conversation. A lot of women are coming into this conversation. Strong, loud women. And they are coming from around the world. And I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to end up consulting with them on the various issues in different countries. A lot of this comes down to education. And part of it is people like Kathy Sierra and people like me getting up and telling people their, their stories. Because when all this started happening to me, a bunch of FreeBSD developers messaged me on Facebook like, is this a real thing? Is this real life? 
and like this doesn't I was like this doesn't happen to you and they're like no and I was so surprised by that and they were surprised this was happening to me because we don't talk about it and we need to talk about it and by talking about it we can educate everybody around us and they can start looking for these things because if you're not looking for it you don't see it have you tried to contact the UN who has a department for this although they are completely ignorant about the subject because we did I got started on this two months ago Okay. It has been a whirlwind since then. One of the reasons I put off writing my talk until last night was because every week something major is changing. This is moving so fast and my board is four people but um, most of them are just kind of advisory and working on the nonprofit stuff for me. So it's mostly just me. It's just me who's going out and working with law enforcement and writing code and learning how to run an open source project which is really hard by the way. Um, and. If I had a cloning device, there would be an army of me, and that would be terrifying for everybody, and you know, the trolls would hopefully go away. But yeah, it, it's just me, so um, over time. Uh, and do you see, and this is the key question, do you see any way that we can modify the OS in order to, and I don't know the answer to this, but rather than depending on the social networks to promote their own privacy laws and so on and so forth, um, put it in, and this is just a speculation, put it in base so that there can be filters uh, which could be uh, linked to APIs of these social networks or something like that. Do, do, do you see that happening or is this just too far thinking? What do you mean put it in well, the OS? We, again, I come back to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, the, the social networks are very conscious about the U.S. and European laws and uh, Europe is doing things and the U.S. is doing things. Oh yeah, things. European law on data and protection is crazy. In China, uh, major, major issue and of course the providers, the people who are running the social networks will not do anything about it. <coughs> if the creator of operating systems could do something about it, could at least provide some, and here I'm completely dreaming, but provide some code that people could start to use it rather than develop it, then maybe we could help. I don't know. I don't know the answer because I'm like you. We turn around and we find nothing. I am very American in my thoughts about free speech. Mm -hmm. And I'm very wary of imposing any type of filtering software or tying anything like in that low of a level. Um, Despite everything that's been happening, I think people do have the right to be an asshole on the internet. They just need to be better about it. <laughs> and we need to have ways to filter things out. Um, and when there are serious things, we need to have law enforcement involved. I don't like the idea of actually preventing people from being able to say things. But my freedom stops where your freedom starts. I'm very aware. <laughs> This is, see, this is why the EFF likes me, because I can see both sides of this, and I'm really scared of stopping people from being able to say things on the internet. Um, but on the other hand, if there, if there are no consequences, then it's silencing minorities, it's silencing women, it's silencing people that are getting harassed. So there has to be a delicate balance, and I don't personally believe that implementing any type of safeguards in your operating system is a good idea. I, it can be abused. Um, Carlton is more, so we're actually going to be tying in with like, we're talking about like a Chrome plugin and it's a way for people who aren't necessarily technically competent to be able to log their harassment because when you're getting harassment it's usually coming over many different forms of like Twitter, Facebook, emails. Um, taking screenshots isn't something that everybody thinks to do and they don't always know what data they need to save like on Twitter for example the tweet ID. So this is more making it easy for people to save the harassment they've received because it's a good idea to save it because you need to take it to law enforcement. Um, this also is a really great way for us to do some data mining because I can find lots of harassment on Twitter. Going to other networks is a little bit harder. Uh, so I think getting people involved and actually saying, hey, this is kind of messed up is a good idea. There are other projects that are kind of similar. Like there's a new thing coming out called HeartMob which I'm a little bit wary of because I don't like anything that has the word mob in it. Um, and that has to do also with tracking harassment, but it's more publicly facing and it's so presumably 
you go in and you say, I'm being harassed, and these people descend on you with love. I don't think this is a good idea, personally. I think it has a high likelihood of being abused, um, but that's something else that's happening in this space. What do you recommend in terms of like community-wide stuff, like from, from obviously from, from the user groups in local cities, uh, on up to conferences, sneak conferences, in our seat. I mean, is it, it types of meetings, types of discussion, types of activities, and so on and so forth, outside of what you've already discussed. So the slide that you had was actually a great start. Um, just talking about the fact that there is harassment is, you know, it lets people be able to talk about their experiences. And seeing guys, especially white guys, talk about, you know, how we have a problem with diversity and we have a problem with, you know, people being assholes. Um, that sends a really good message and it makes it seem like it's a safe space. So making safe spaces so women can say, hey, this guy, he said things to me that aren't good. That's, that's something that all communities should be doing. Um, and whenever you see something bad happen around you, call it out. Be that guy. Be the one that's like, you shouldn't be doing that. Because guys tend to listen to other guys more than they listen to women when they're doing things like that. So with all your analysis, data mining, et cetera, have you identified key demographics and then looked at sociology around those demographics to try and understand what's the root cause? Because obviously, uh, I think almost everyone here is, you know, a large portion of a white, mm -hmm. large portion of male, but we're not all extreme assholes. <laughs> um, so, no. so trying to understand, <laughs> but trying to understand the the, the social um, <coughs> genesis, if you will, of those issues. So, the terrifying part of all of this is that a large number of these people are CS students, which means eventually they're going to be in our industry. <laughs> And I'm hoping they grow out of this. I don't know if they will. And personally, I think that this is the result of, so well, when we were growing up, we had IRC. Kids don't really go on IRC so much anymore. Instead, they have the chans. They have 4chan and they have 8chan. And if you remember back to when you were a teenager, you felt really powerless. You felt like you didn't have control over anything. You felt like you didn't belong. And whenever you're part of this anonymous message board, this mob forms. And they're able to do things, not necessarily nice things, but they're able to accomplish things and they have this level of power. And there's this level of acceptance because you're part of the mob. So people aren't applying critical thinking. And they're getting to be really, really jaded and there's no empathy and it's not a good place. So if you have children, don't let them go on the chans because that seems to be where all of this is originating from. And it's not like this is a new problem. This existed, this problem existed before the chans. It's just getting worse. And I think that that's the reason why. You have to consider that, yeah, I'm up here telling my story in front of a large group of people. Most people wouldn't be doing this. Uh, most women are not going to want to do this. I probably wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't BSD Chem because this is a friendly crowd. Because we're used to people coming up and confronting us and being like, so feminism, what's up with that? And like getting in our faces and... I, I just spent the BSD scene. Okay. Now. BSD scene's fine. Like, those people are great. <laughs> <laughs> like, I actually haven't encountered any of this in the BSD community. One thing to keep in mind is 
think back to high school and how you were bullied then. And I doubt that there are a few of you here that were not bullied in high school because I'm not that much different to you. We were all different in high school. And then once you get out of high school, they change. All those bulliers reached their peak during high school and we're still reaching out. And one thing to, to throw out, looking around the room, the people who show up at BSD can tend frequently to be senior people in the industry. We are team leads and network leads and, and whatnot. And people, God help us, they look up to us in the outside world. <laughs> <Exactly, right? laughs> <laughs> saying things like when Gamergate comes up at, I, I talk at a lot of Linux groups about uh, stuff on uh, books and, and whatnot. They ask me to come speak. Great. When Gamergate comes up, I just come flat out and say, no, that's not acceptable. They're mongoloid cretins. Fuck everything about the Linux community. <laughs> <laughs> More rumors can be started. <laughs> I, I understand that there's probably a bigger problem in the Linux community, but isn't that a problem to solve? It is a problem to solve. It's just really frustrating because I got into an argument with ESR the other day. Oh. No, it didn't get me. I'd never talked to him before. And it's great. He was like, yeah, sexism doesn't exist in open source. <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, we can have fun with that. Right. So I was actually thinking about um, this age thing, the power thing, and the Linux thing uh, for the last two weeks. Because it really seems that the people that are going after you are those that feel particularly powerless, particularly lacking the fear of the control of their own lives. And just yesterday, somebody else told me, showing up at the Linux user group, it's a different experience than <coughs> showing up at the BSD group, completely <coughs> independently of you. And um, I wonder whether you, you have the same view that um, younger people are maybe a little more likely to go at you, more likely to feel this powerlessness or lack of control that they try to compensate for and that older people who do are those that are still stuck in that state when they should have built a life for themselves? A lot of them are teenagers. Um, usually about as old as it gets is like 24 from what we've seen. It's mostly teenagers and CS students and mostly white male CS students. Um, there are a few older people who are involved in all of this, but they are generally the people that are profiting. So the lawyer guy and um, Milo Yiannopoulos, the reporter from Breitbart, and the people who are speaking out are the ones like, that are old. Are, somehow they're making money off of it is what we can tell. Like Milo had nothing to write about before Gamergate, and now this is his bread and butter. Yep. Clearly. But there's a strong, strong uh, age connection. There is. I think, I don't know if it's because these people are growing up in a different environment or if eventually people just grow out of whatever this is. Someone had a home, disgusting misogynist 
seeing uh, on our email list. And we were at a point where, like, by self post, we stopped reading his emails anyway because he was talking complete rubbish all the time. And other people actually in the nice pub spoke out and actually raised it as an issue. I mean, I mean, granted, it's not just about not making it socially acceptable. It's actually it's about making a larger argument. But more importantly, actually, when you have a broad layer of people who actually take the responsibility and say, you know, no, this isn't acceptable, yeah. that the confidence is speak out about, that to me is worth 10 times any policy of the ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, sorry. One thing I'm feeling a bit um, uncomfortable about is that sometimes people tend to think this is a problem of, say, extremism, of a very, um, very strong things happening. My impression is that even in, in relatively good communities where a lot of people are aware, stuff still happens of disrespect, of, um, of discrimination. And uh, these things um, George was just talking about, I think tend to be observed everywhere, even here. Like, I give you one example from a German university a few, a few months ago. We were in the student parliament in the process of discussing the policies of the student body. And as soon as a woman started talking about um, topics that are regarded as topics usually covered by women, the, the president of the executive committee of the students, a, a really good guy who is aware about a lot of things, started talking to his neighbor about different things and there were murmurs. It, it, it's really a context where you wouldn't expect that. And I'm quite sure such things can happen even in, in DSD communities. <coughs> and then it did help a bit when, when another guy spoke up and said, okay, why is this happening right now? And maybe that is, that is also one thing where policies can help, not so much policies on the, on the paper, it's probably a bit more about what happens in the, in the heads, even in minds. But discussing the policy, if you don't overdo it, discussing it now and then can help a bit. There's that, and we all need to realize that everybody's a little bit sexist. Everybody, yeah. even I'm a little bit sexist. I have those inclinations, and we need to stop being so defensive about admitting that. Because when we can start saying, you know, hey, I kind of screw up sometimes, and I do these things I shouldn't be doing, we can actually catch ourselves doing them, and we don't get quite so defensive when people call us out on it. Um, there's also this idea for people who are problematic in the community. Um, have you heard of the broken stare? It's an idea in communities to where there's a person you have to work around. Because, you know, they're vital, you want them there, um, but they're kind of a problem. And so it's like having a staircase in your house and you're walking up the stairs and there's a broken stair there and you just kind of get used to walking around it. Like maybe you just take one more stair up. You just forget that it's there after a while. You accept it as being a part of your everyday life. And then somebody comes in, like a new person, and they're like, why is the stair broken? Why haven't you fixed this yet? And it's like a light bulb turns on. And so we need to be careful of you know, the broken stairs in our community, which can be a person or it can be, you know, something like an event that's actually happening. So, with the, the fact that uh, a lot of these morons are of a certain demographic and they end up following this mob culture when they go to the Chans, etc., if you take them out of that Chan environment, say somebody goes and targets them directly to you know, sit them down and have a word. My inclination is that they would not necessarily toe the line that they have been speaking about when they're in the chat and they will be all oh, no that's you know, that whole, you know, misogynistic mentality is horrible, etc. Yet so you kind of leave them alone and then they go back into the chat and it just switches back again without them thinking about because of their age and, and lack of life experience. I haven't really seen anyone be able to hide it when they've been part of Chan's. Like it just, it becomes part of who they are and how they treat people and they slip up eventually. Um, 
you can usually tell when somebody spent some time there, even like as a kid. Like Zoe, the person who's being targeted by this, she spent time in the Chans, and she's like, yeah, I understand this mentality, and she still has problems with it to this day. So, how, how are we doing on time, by the way? When is this over? 12.30, Awesome. <laughs> I could really use like some tequila right about now, so. <laughs> It's really ugly, so no. Um, <laughs> so um, we will soon. We have one. Don't do it because I, we announced this at GDC, the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, and. I've been kind of thinking about it for a while, and we were kind of planning on it, and Zoe was giving a talk there, and I was like, you know what, we're gonna do it tomorrow. We're gonna announce this tomorrow, what's a good name? Um, so we came up with a name for it, and like, somebody made an ugly ass logo, and then we just like, we did it all live. It was pretty awesome. I mean, it had a lot of impact. Google actually tweeted at me 15 minutes after we announced it, saying, we would like to meet. Um, so it was a good time to announce it, but like, our site is terrible. If you go to the site, the logo's there, and we're, we're working on all of that still. The presentation was less important than actually being able to start doing work. Uh, will you do it at some stage? Yes. We're already talking to a couple of designers. And put it on the previous email list so that we can be informed of it? Okay. Well, uh, with the approval of the presentation, <laughs> you don't need permission to post to email. It's not just that, it's that anywhere my name goes, they follow. Um, they've already emailed the mailing list several times. One time they tried to send pizza to my apartment and they set the uh, email confirmation to the FreeBSD mailing list, except they sent it to the right building, the wrong apartment, in a city I didn't live in anymore. So somebody ended up getting pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know who. It's not necessarily a great question, but if somebody wants to get involved with helping but can't be seen publicly to be helping, what would be the best way to help? Contact me and come up with some sort of pseudonym on GitHub like something you have never used before, because they have been trying to dox everybody who's involved with this. Um, but yeah, contact me privately so I know who it is, because I have to be really, really careful about who, you know, what we're submitting, because one of their ideas was actually <laughs> to insert an XSS exploit in a Perl script. They wanted to do this. This was like their big idea on how to hack GG Autoblocker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Colin. So you, you mentioned you have a, a very American view on free speech. Uh, what's your view on anonymous free speech? Mm -hmm. I think we should have pseudonyms. Um, pseudonyms are different from being anonymous. I think that's fine. I don't think anybody should be forced to use their real names because that <coughs> affects a lot of people who would be hurt by it. Um, being anonymous can be helpful in some situations. It's, it's my ideas on this are evolving still. I obviously am biased because of the chance. <laughs> um, in a forum, I think as long as there's good moderation, it can be a good idea to have some anonymity going on. Um, people can post about things they normally wouldn't be able to talk about, but you need to have that moderation in place so it doesn't become abusive. Uh, if you are an event organizer, I would encourage you uh, to look at PenguinCon in Detroit. Yes, it's a Linux event. They have done an incredibly good job of dealing with harassment in an event where you have thousands of people showing up. It, it is impressive and uncanny, and it is not impressive. What was that? Can you say the name of the thing again? Penguin Con. I need a better name. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. There was this thing for a while, um, I don't know, I'm sure it was, but basically finding out who those harassers are and calling their moms. I'm glad not to talk with their kids. I did this. <laughs> I actually contacted a few parents on Facebook. The parents did not believe me. School principals have the same issue, right? Well, not the same issue necessarily in the sense that they are harassing, but they, in the sense that uh, 
almost all of us are in some way sexist, and very few people really understand these issues. So <laughs> even if those mm -hmm. parents are perfectly normal people, they, they will... 60% six, six of uh, parents of overly obese children don't actually recognize any indicators, etc., even when they're uh, approached with um, facts from uh, doctors, etc., because to them, it's their child. So trying to break that maternal and paternal link to open their eyes is much, much harder because a lot of parents believe that they're my child, they can't do anything wrong. <coughs> Even when they witness their child doing something nasty as a young child biting another kid or whatever, they think, oh, he, he, he must have slipped or something, and, and they'll make excuses for their actions. They don't want to admit that Actually, they're not as golden as they believe they are. So I'm, I'm not entirely surprised. They're disappointed, but I'm not entirely surprised. That's definitely part of it. Parents don't want to believe their kids could be that way. And it's also if they go out and Google my name to figure out who I am. Google SEO abuse is a real thing. Um, there's a lot of bad stuff on there about me right now. It's the top hit. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> I Googled you this morning before the search. Oh, yeah, so you came here prepared. The top hit is an incredibly misogynistic page. Which was actually, which was written by the same person, yeah, it was written by the same person who harassed Kathy Sierra, who's been going after me for 20 years. And then Gamergate found it, and then they built upon it. I suggest that there's a lot of smart people here that can do that better than they can. Um, I'm actually going to Google directly because I want to see Encyclopedia Dramatica delisted. Well, you already did when we talked yesterday. I will look into it next week. It's going to be a hard topic. Uh, I know Anita Sarkeesian's been talking to them about it too. Like all of us feminists, we actually do have a secret cabal. We do meet up and talk about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So we're all kind of working on the same stuff and we plan together on how to attack companies and how to go in and like use our different contacts. Um, so getting Encyclopedia Dramatica delisted would be really good. There's also other sites that are specifically to shame and harass people that we're going to try to go after, but ED is the big one. a really bad idea. It's, so we have to be very careful that as angry as we are and as much attacked as we always are, we have ethics. And we know the real names of a lot of these people because we're really good at finding things, way better than they are. And we will not publish these things because then those people would be harassed. And just because we don't like them and just because they're stupid children doesn't mean that they should be harassed. These rules should apply to everyone. And so we have to, we just can't do that. It's a, it, that would end up being a name and shame site that would eventually need to be delisted from Google. <laughs> how, how can people outside of the US um, help in the efforts? Contributing to the code, getting involved in some of the projects we have going on. Carlton's a big one. It's an idea that I had. Um, the GitHub has a lot more info on it because I put up like a basic planning doc, but I, I'm DevOps. I'm barely a dev. <laughs> and I can plan like system architecture really well, but security and code architecture, that's all kind of new to me. So having help coming in with that stuff and people telling me like, this is a good idea or this is a bad idea, it, early on in the planning stages, having the community work on these projects from the very, very start, um, that's what we need help with. So code and money, money is good. Like, I'm actually having to leave the San Francisco Bay Area because it's really hard to exist on less than 36 k a year there. Um, my apartment is, like, getting jacked up to, like, $3,000 a month. So I'm going to Portland. <laughs> and, yeah. So I have a question or remark. And my question is sort of how you deal with it. So there are also quite a lot of feminists and gay 
they they don't have things that are like the exact same as the we do have, and they also experience different things that are not related to machine experience. But typically, the entire community does see families as one large thing. So, for example, for example, Anita Tarkiti, you you mentioned her a minute ago. Her opinions are likely not shared by all families out there. And there has been some, some controversy with like the things that she has done. I mean, she released a video series showing misogyny in gaming that was sort of a quite one-sided view, and she she lost some popularity because of that. I'm going to disagree uh, with you there. Well, but sure. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, that's no thing. But I mean, the the problem is that because of those things, people sort of start to see families as you know one big thing, right? And as, as soon as someone disagrees with one one of those people in that community, suddenly trust is lost in all of this. How, how would you deal with that? Also? Okay, assuming that all feminists actually think the same thing is like assuming that everybody in open source can agree on the same license. Yeah. <laughs> like that, yeah, that is how broad it is. And like, I'm friends with Anita. I got to be friends with her after all of this started. Like, she lives close to me. We hang out and get tacos like once a week. And it's amazing because we have different views, um, very different views on a lot of things. And there are people who we generally don't talk to because they have drastically different views, which I think are actually abusive and terrible. Um, I used to be one of those people that didn't like feminists. And I would talk about it. I was like, these goddamn tech feminists, they are making my life harder. And I actually blame FreeBSD for that because you guys are awesome and I haven't had to deal with like all that much in this community that everybody else was having to deal with. <laughs> so I was like, what are you talking about sexism and open source? I mean, open source is great. And then I hit my 30s and I started like looking back on the things that had happened to me. I'm like, wow, okay, maybe that doesn't happen to everybody. And maybe I didn't bring that down on myself, like stuff outside of FreeBSD. Um, when women hit their 30s, we've noticed in general, their views on this stuff can change a lot and realizing that like not, not your experiences aren't necessarily indicative of everybody's experiences. And guys need to realize that too that every woman is different, every woman has experienced different things, and we all have different views, and it shouldn't really come back on us to have to explain that. <laughs> I mean, guys need to realize that everyone is different, that feminist isn't just a, you know, a label that you stick on somebody to put them in a corner and be like, oh, you obviously believe this thing. They think that all feminists hate porn, that all of us want to have like women in video games wearing like all the armor so everything is covered, and we all have different views. So I don't know if that really answered the question or not. <laughs> you did. OK. Um, okay. Um, I think uh, my, my response to what you would have said there is that assuming that everyone who says that they're a feminist thinks exactly the same. It's basically what you said there. But also, you can disagree with Anita Sarkeesian and not disagree, and not disagree with the rest of feminists. Mm -hmm. like, I think Anita Sarkeesian has some very valid points, but it's cultural critique. I mean, if you're going to get bent and bent out of shape like some cultural critique, then there's stuff out there that's really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It is, and a lot of women are also tired of being asked questions and tired of being asked to explain feminism. So you may not always get positive responses. Um, I try to be patient, sometimes I'm not. Here I am, because this is kind of a new thing for me. But if you go to me on Twitter, I will probably tell you to fuck off and go, <laughs> go Google. <laughs> um, but yeah, we need to all start you know, doing research on these subjects on our own too. Instead of just going to women and asking their stories, search out the stories. Your problem is that someone will come up to you because you've used a heavy word on Twitter. Oh, that happens all the time. 
and it'll happen. It happens to me. It'll happen to you if you go on Twitter. It's something you have to realize that you're talking about a sensitive subject, and people are hurt. People have been through a lot, and it's not really so much about you. Um, it could be, you know, their experiences. And we need to stop being so defensive. We need to be like, well, maybe actually that word wasn't the best word to use, and we need to listen to what they're saying, and maybe they have a valid point. So. It's about being like, you know, we all are growing. We all need to learn these things. Is that it? Um, how receptive have you found the companies running like the social media or forums in general and stuff like that? Like, did you come across abusive speech? Like, how receptive are they to, like, you know? I actually have special levels of access um, into some of these companies, and I can report things and send emails. And for example, I posted a selfie with Zoe Quinn, and we were at Microsoft, and we decided to post a picture together, and it broke the internet because everybody went nuts. And they mass reported my account for spam. My account got shut down on Twitter. And so I made a phone call, and it was turned back on five minutes later. They're really receptive to me because I'm able to sit there and I'm able to talk tech with them and I have a you know a somewhat in the middle of the road point of view. I don't want to come in and say, we need to get rid of all free speech ever. Um, I, so they're good with me. We're working on actually developing solutions so people can escalate harassment through us and uh, Crash Override is another organization that Zoe runs and that deals more with the people who are actually being targeted by harassment and they can do things like escalate directly to Twitter. So if a threat does come in, they can contact Twitter and usually get a response within about 15, 20 minutes. So obviously that doesn't scale. We're still kind of working out the kinks of it. Um, but it's a good start. Twitter's trying really, really, really hard. And I think it's safe to say that harassment's an issue that affects pretty much any site that has people on it, that has where people can interact. Twitter's coming under fire and they're in the spotlight, but this problem isn't unique to them but they're the, probably the company we're interacting with the most. And I've been defending them since January when I first started talking with them because they've done an amazing job. Anyone else? Give me some time to think about it. That's not something I can really r rattle off the top of my head, and I think we're actually over time. <laughs> so thank you so much.